two, three, starting. If it weren't past midnight and I should be asleep, I would um, have set this up on a tripod and do this properly. But it's kind of nice to do things improperly and impulsive sometimes. One of the ideas that I had for this birthday project, <laughs> which was not about writing, but about telling stories, not writing, to experience the telling the stories, not sitting alone at the keyboard and agonizing over getting something done and getting something adequately done perfectly. And so like, you know, circumventing a lot of neurotic obsessiveness, but still getting a job done. You are awake also. Why are you awake so late? We're all in different time zones. So anyway, one of the ideas I had, I wrote out this big list of all the stories I wanted to tell. And I said, I'm going to tell all of these stories. And I've, of course, making been making it too big of a deal, which is just making me not do it. Uh, I just was trying to, you know, get ready to go to sleep. And I was looking at the phone before going to sleep, which sometimes is a good idea. Seems like a good idea, like reading a book. But it's usually a bad idea because the book of the internet goes on infinitely. And uh, Facebook suggested I might like some magazine. Yeah, I'm in the same time zone as you are, so hi. Um, Facebook suggested I might like some magazine about men stuff. And uh, I flipped through a couple of the articles in it. And one of them was about an artist named Kenneth Tam, who I believe is based in L.A. Ooh, Deverick Theater. Hi, Hans. Anyway, um, this artist who... Um, who made a lot of videos based on um, the awkwardness of men together. And he would, he would ask people from Reddit or Craigslist to come and partake in these really awkward rituals of men bonding and basically being vulnerable and awkward around each other. And I watched some of them and I was like, that's right. You can get really amazing shit from making people do weird, random things. And the art, because some people regard me as an artist, which I love, because I used to be like, everybody must be an artist, I must be an artist, and then I gave up on being an artist. But I love it that some people like think I'm an actual, really accomplished artist. And doing stuff makes you an artist. I thought, okay, so this big list and this big idea I have, I just need to start doing it. So I had an, an, you know put off doing the project until I was ready. There's always the one more thing to do until you start. Maybe you've encountered that. And uh, I just went through the whole list, and I just numbered them in the order they were in because I wanted to organize them all and make them linear. Just let go of that. I have 145 stories. One of them was a repeat, and some of them were kind of clumped together, and I unclumped them. So that's a lot of stories. And then I have an app on here that has a random number generator in it. And one of the stories is about the Diceman, which I'm just going to use a tiny bit about that. As in the, in the, there's this concept of making a list of things you could do just from your intuition and then rolling a dice and seeing which one you actually will do. And making a game out of, like, I have to do the one, whatever the dice is rolled. And I did that for a while. And so I'm playing that game with these telling of the stories. So I wrote out this list from a hundred uh, from one to 145, and I just put that in the random number generator. So the story I got tonight was 121, which goes like this: Once upon a time, <laughs> I was doing an experiment of not traveling and living in New York City. And a woman I met who was a friend of a friend needed someone uh, she needed someone to sublet her apartment and it was in the Ansonia, which is a famous big old building in New York City. It's got a really weird history to it. Um, the walls are three feet thick and a lot of it and they used to have gigantic copper pipes running through it and there's a, the, before the days of air conditioning he pumped cold water through the building to keep it cold in the winter in the summer and warm in the winter and for a while there were bears living on the roof 
and seals living in the lobby. The guy was crazy. He had farms out in the country where he would often take very young girls to have fun with. He'd tie them up and do weird things to them. Anyway, it has a special place in the heart of many gay New Yorkers because it had the Continental Club baths in the basement of it where Bette Midler got her start and lots of gay men had sex. So I jumped at the opportunity to um, live in it for a month. And the woman I was renting it from was a choreographer who had worked with the Cockettes, so that's also a great piece of history. And I had a lover slash friend at the time who was a Dutch fashion designer who had lived in there for 17 years, but had not been back in there since he left it under great duress. So there's a lot of good pressure and a lot of good things happened. And this wasn't the intention of the story I was going to tell, but it's all just background. There's endless background. I lived in the in the building for a month. I got to experience cruising in Central Park, and there's a lot of stories that could branch out of that. It wasn't ultimately as hot as I had wished for. I had this lover many years before that that I met in Southern Oregon. Oh, interesting. I've never had that bad signal thing I'm up on a mountain Mount Shasta right now anyway I had this lover who I'd met in Oregon and had when I was still a traveler I had uh, connected with him in various spots though he did come to New York every year and while I was renting this room in the Insonia he came to meet me and I didn't think that I don't think that we went back to my room I think I immediately took him up onto the roof. I mean, a lot of people would jump at the opportunity to explore the Ansonia Hotel. And we and it had a really nice roof deck. And I took him up to the roof late in the day. And we were staring out over the city, and it was kind of twilight. It was like the sun had... I think we went up there to see sunset, yeah. And so it was twilight, and there was no one else up there. It was shocking. It was in July or August... It was July. And um, one thing led to another, and I was sitting on... The, he got all sexy with me, and I was sitting on a lounge chair looking up at the sky. And this is sexual details here, so click off if you're not interested. I'm not somebody who usually enjoys getting my cock sucked. You know, a lot of people are like, who doesn't? I'm one of those people who usually don't. I just don't care. It's not interesting. It's not interesting for me to just lay back and get my cock sucked. It's just not something that I ever really want to happen. However, I'm polite, you know, so he wanted to do that. We had most of our clothes on, and there's, of course, some perverse pleasure about being in a public place where you might get caught on a roof of a famous building in New York City. And so he's sucking my cock. And I do it. have a really magical relationship with him. And I'm looking up at the sky. And I was telling somebody this story a couple days ago. And I said, it'd be really great if I could say I came when this happened. But that's not true. And he said, you know what? It makes the story a lot better. You should tell the story as if it were true. So let's say I'm on the roof of the Ansonia Hotel and a magical, like, mystical shaman lover of mine is sucking my cock, and it's awesome. And I have my eyes open, staring at the sky in the twilight, and the sky's getting darker, and the stars are coming out. But there's still light, but the stars are coming out. And just as I come and my eyes get really wide, I see this gigantic burst of light in the sky it's a star it's a bright star that gets bigger and bigger and bigger till it becomes kind of huge and then fades out like one pulse of a heart and being the science nerd that I am I'm like holy fucking shit did I just see a supernova We relaxed for a while after that. 
and then went down to my room and talked for a little bit before he went home, or back to where he was staying, which wasn't too far away, Central Park West. And a few weeks later, I kept thinking about that image of this burst of light in the sky, and I googled it. And in fact, I was fortunate enough to have looked at the sky to actually see a supernova. In New York City. You know, of all the chance of just looking in the right part of the sky, the moment that a star died, probably hundreds of thousands of years ago, the light reaching our planet, I happened to be looking in the sky while my cock was in a friend's mouth. <laughs> Some girls just have more fate than others. <laughs> so anyway, I tell stories a lot. And I tell stories over and over and over. And as a traveler, you know, you meet people and you start having conversations and you tell the story and you're like, have I told you the story already? Because you just told somebody. Or did you just tell somebody recently or was it a long time ago? And was you, were you the person I was telling this story? And each time I tell a story and most other travelers that I've talked to, each time you tell a story, you wonder, is it the same story you told before? Do you remember new parts of it or do you make up new parts of it? It really depends on it really depends on the mood you're in and what people think what how people are responding to it you know the audience and what kind of information they feed to you oh I'm gonna to respond to that so my friend Urso who I've not seen in years just made a comment um, about that he hasn't that it surprises him that he hasn't heard um, of anyone having sex during the solar eclipse that recently happened, and he was surprised by that. So I just saw the so a total solar eclipse for the first time in my life, and um, I kind of I had like I always do kind of rituals around new moons and full moons, little little rituals. Sometimes I make big deals out of them. Sometimes they're just small and internal. But I had lots of intentions for the solar eclipse. And I didn't do any of them because as soon as it went into totality, I fucking flipped out. I started screaming, like just laughing, screaming, ecstatic terror, thrill. It was amazing. And I thought about it afterwards that when I first got into the idea of sex magic, I would be like fucking somebody and or they'd be fucking me or something and perhaps leading up to it, around it, during it, in the foreplay, I would think of intentions that I wanted to put into the sexual energy, and I would, I would know, I'd be like, this would be the most powerful, I can, if I can think of this exactly when the orgasm's happening, right? And I felt like the eclipse was like that, that like leading up to the eclipse, even when the eclipse started, when the, when the moon was moving over the sun, there were, you know, in my heart and in my mind, there were ideas, there were intentions brewing but when the actual like total eclipse happened it was like the the power of an orgasm when you're young at sex and just totally overwhelmed by it there was zero zero consciousness zero like togetherness i was just like blown out of my fucking mind like a kid having an orgasm just like what the fuck is going on and afterwards, I mean, it took, I don't know how long it took for me to come back down. I mean, it really felt like a like full Earth orgasm, full like Earth matrix, uh, the whole network of consciousness on the planet blowing out, or at least in the whole swath of totality. As the, as the, the shadow of the moon covered us, the 5,000 people in the camp that I was in all started screaming in awe, in awe, like genuine awe it was astounding and it was very much just like a gigantic huge group orgasm and all of the lofty ideas about 
our good intentions and our prayers or any of the crap like that was totally tossed out in the actual moment when, of course, it would have been most powerful to have consciousness. And <clears throat> it even reminds me of all the times I've done salvia. I thought of that as well, that it's so powerful that it just knocks you off your ass. And it took many times of doing it before I was able to come into it with a type of groundedness to carry a type of awareness into the experience as opposed to just being bowled over by it. And that's most of life. You know, we go through life having experiences and just being like, whoa, here I am being a human, falling in love, being angry, being sad, whoa. And back up. Uh, salvia, it's a <clears throat> shorthand for salvia divinorum. Uh, it's this family, it's the taxonomy genus species of um, a plant. The genus salvia is um, what most common sages belong to. There's some who live in the Artemisia family, but they're not true sages, they're just called sages. <clears throat> and like cooking sages or smudging sages. So salvia is referring to salvia divinorum in English is referred to as the diviner sage and is the strongest hallucinogen known to science gram per gram. And it grows in Oaxaca, Mexico, 10,000 feet in the mountains and has been used and abused a lot in America because it's not a controlled substance and it's a <clears throat> strong hallucinogen. It kind of makes you, it's a dissociative, some would say, and um, it makes you, it, I think it activates the same part in the brain that dreams do, that paralyzes your body so you don't thrash around and talk, and that, of course, some people are not so activated in because they talk or they sleepwalk. Because um, a lot of people, when they smoke salvia, they can't walk or talk. Yeah, it sounds like an artificial sweetener. Um, yeah, there's so many drugs in the world. But this is a plant, not a drug. However, it is a very strong uh, medicine plant. We can talk about it as an entheogen. And it's used in Oaxaca, like, by chewing on it. But Americans, you know, don't like strong, pungent, bitter, uh, tanniny tastes like that. So it's smoked, and they usually uh, extract it and then layer it back in so that it's super concentrated. So you can just take one hit, because it's so overpowering if you do it like that, that it knocks you into another dimension. And when I say that, like... Mm, the experience most people have is that they fall into another reality that feels more real than this life. And usually they'll have an experience like, oh, here I am back in real reality. Like real reality. Like it's as if you know, when you wake up from a dream and you're like, oh, this is, I'm back in my real life. Lots of times when people, I gave it to 200 people over a two year period and um, interviewed them all. I wish I would have recorded it all on camera, but oh well. Um, the difficulty of asking permission is always cumbersome. Uh, that most people have this experience as if like, oh, I, I was just back in the real world. And then they, you know, come back to this world and they're like, oh, what, 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 sorry, what was real? Who, what was going on? But one of the things I loved about Salvia was the first thing people said most of the time, as soon as they could speak again, was, Wow. So I got to hear a whole bunch of people honestly and earnestly express awe. And it's a really beautiful sound to hear somebody say the word wow, like wholeheartedly. I just, I just think it's astounding. So that's kind of, um, I, I, I used it as a reference because when people smoke salvia, it's so dramatic. It just like blows, it, the people have done DMT, it's kind of similar to that. It's very fast, very powerful and you fall into a completely different reality. Um, so much like orgasms, sorry, very much like orgasms, you are overwhelmed by it completely. It, it takes over the whole system. The eclipse was like that. And the more I've had sex and the more I did salvia, the more I'm able to go into these peak experiences with a type of groundedness, familiarity, um, so that I can actually navigate them, like feel them out and be in them with presence, as opposed to just be like, Wah! like going on a roller coaster and just screaming your head off and not actually experiencing what's happening. 
And I felt like, okay, <clears throat> so this is my first eclipse. How many will, I mean, my first total eclipse. So how many total eclipses will it take before I'm like, okay, I can actually pay attention to what's happening and what I'm feeling. I, I read about some scientist who became kind of addicted to them and has seen 35 total, total eclipses now, who just travels around the world and sees every total eclipse that, that happens and because he's just totally addicted to it. And some people do respond like that. And in the world we live in now, we can map it out and we can go and do it. And so it might be something I end up doing for a little while. I don't know. It was, it felt like being on an alien planet because we've, we've stood on this planet so many times and looked at the sky and it's, and seen it in many different forms. I mean, if you're a sky watcher, which I am, I've always been someone who enjoys looking at clouds and stars and constellations and, uh, I you know I went to fucking Iceland so I could look at the Northern Lights for three times and the third time I went was for five weeks just so I could actually experience the Northern Lights and seeing the full expression of the sun with the moon blocking out its face so you can see the corona which is like the giant spaghetti monster that created the universe I mean it's like any it's it's unlike anything I've ever seen. And so it felt like I was on a, a foreign planet, like a place I'd never been before because the sky looked different than I had ever seen it before. It was really amazing. Yeah, Urso, there's another one in 2024 that crosses America, another great American eclipse, TM. But there's another one in two years that goes through South America that's like um, Argentina and Chile. People are going there for that. Anyway, um... This was kind of a nice impulse, and I've been trying to go to sleep for an hour, so I think um, I'm going to do that now. It's been very nice to uh, tell a story. I hope some of you enjoy this. I hope the sound quality is better than the last video I did without a microphone. And um, it's nice to hang out with you, or so I believe I will be coming into the Bay Area sometime in the next week, so maybe I'll see you. Good night. Much love. Sleep well. Enjoy your dreams.